Hi, I'm the Guitar Trooper, YouTube's favorite old guy. For those of you who are new viewers of this channel, you need to know that I am a Beatles fan, both collectively and individually. At the risk of some of you skewering me, there is an aspect of the group, though, that I haven't touched on before and I feel that I should discuss. If you are one that has delved into the recording sessions of the Beatles, you have probably found several instances cited where George Harrison simply could not handle a guitar part. While the following expose is not by any means meant to discount the otherwise competent work that he did, the following three songs between 1963 and 65 are examples that illustrate how George Harrison struggled with some lead guitar parts. Please, give a listen. Number one, There's a Place, recorded February 11th, 1963, 10 a.m., with a harmonica overdub added at 4.15 p.m. February 11, 1963 was a landmark day for the group as they managed to record 10 songs in one day to complete their Please Please Me album. The final master of There's a Place contains no obvious guitar solo work. Well, it's there, but made virtually inaudible by the superimposed harmonica that was added after the last take, which was take number 10, had been recorded. <laughs> The original intent was to have George Harrison play the opening and pre-verse riffs on guitar, but he couldn't nail the timing on the notes. Here's what happened take by take. Take one, complete except Harrison flubs the opening riff. Take two, no real obvious issues, but George Martin didn't like it. Take three, halted because George Harrison came in late on the opening riff notes. Take four, the vocals were rough and the experimental staccato rhythm on the final verse didn't work. Prior to take five, though, Harrison is heard practicing the opening riff and experimenting with a two-string octave version, much like the technique you hear on Please Please Me. Take five, stopped by Paul because Harrison was late again on the timing of the notes in the opening riff. Take six, nearly flawless, but George Martin just wanted another one. Take seven, halted due to George Harrison coming in late on his riff at the end of the first verse. Take eight, drum fill and staccato rhythm guitar didn't work. Take nine, vocal issues and a guitar flub, but it's not specified who did it. And take ten, nearly perfect, but George Harrison's riff note timing was still off. Mostly due to time constraints for the remaining recording of the rest of the album, they moved on, at least briefly. Later in the day, at 4.15 p.m., they decide to return to the song, and John covers up George Harrison's solo work with a harmonica solo using the same notes. This is a superimposed track over the Take 10 Master, requiring three more takes. The final results, Take 13, which effectively obliterated the Harrison solo work, was the master used on the album. Courtesy of YouTube channel Rock Band Stems, here is the isolated lead track from that master, which includes both the original Harrison track and the John Lennon harmonica overdub that was intended to cover it up. Lennon played the harmonica lead notes timed exactly as they wanted to hear them. The mistiming of the guitar solo is evident. <laughs> Number two, A Hard Day's Night, recorded April 16th, 1964. To be fair, the exhibited takes are the very first one, which one would expect to be as rough as a corn cob, and it doesn't miss that mark, and take seven, which one would expect to be more even and polished, which it was, except for George's solos. Here is the first portion of the guitar solo piece from take one. <laughs> Here is the same portion of the song from take number seven. So the question becomes, how do we get from that on take seven to this 
on the final take number nine. Although it is unclear exactly when the work began on cleaning up the Harrison guitar lead, the session ended at 10 p.m. Ultimately, George Martin played the solo on the piano and then cut the tape playback speed to 50% and had Harrison record his guitar following the piano as a guide track at an octave low and at half speed. Harrison performed the lead solo perfectly at half the tempo. As you can hear, the guitar work on take 7 is still very rough and illustrates the reasoning for the tape speed solution from George Martin that was used over the final take, which was take 9. To his credit, as far as we know, George Harrison played the final rolling arpeggio at full speed, though. According to Jeff Emmerich, George would spend a lot of time working out solos. Everything was a little bit harder for him. Nothing quite came easily. Number three, Another Girl, recorded Monday and Tuesday, February 15th and 16th, 1965. It is the Beatles' first day in recording sessions for the movie that will be entitled Help. At 7 p.m., an initial backing track is recorded, and then the other instruments, including the lead guitar fill pieces, are to be added to that backing track along with the vocals. George Harrison plays the lead guitar fill overdubs without too much fuss, although a number of them are quite rough, but the final flourish is a problem. The seventh take is finally used, but Paul isn't completely satisfied with it. February 16th, 1964 is the last day for work on Another Girl. Paul, listening along with George Martin to the playback of the Take 7 from the previous day, finally decides that George Harrison's guitar work on the song is not going to work. Paul does the overdubs himself using his Epiphone Casino. George Harrison's original lead guitar fills, including the final flourish, are erased. So there you have it. Once again, George Harrison was a valuable member of what is undeniably the spearhead group of the British Invasion and the most innovative of the bands of the 1960s. As I stated in the beginning, this is not meant to distract from other competent guitar work from George Harrison. It is rather simply meant to be a reality check. Feel free to comment and discuss, as usual. Hey, thanks as always for watching, and I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do me a favor and click on that like, thumbs up icon, and leave a comment. Let me know what you think. You can also use comments to suggest video subject matter regarding pop music and pop music culture between the 1950s and the 1970s. A great thing that you can do also to support the channel is just sharing the video with your friends. Just click on the arrow icon and pick the destination person. It helps us expand the audience. Speaking of supporting the channel, this would be a great time to subscribe if you're not yet a subscriber. It's easy and it's free and it lets YouTube know that you support the channel. Just click on the subscribe button and be sure to select the top notification bell on the drop down menu so that you'll be notified whenever I post new content for the public. If you would like the opportunity to see new content a few days earlier when it is viewable only to channel members, you can upgrade your subscription to become a channel member. Just click on the join icon and follow the instructions. It's not free to join, but it's as cheap as YouTube would let me make it. <laughs> Thanks again for watching.